Don't we usually have a light? Oh, but it would enter. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Hello. <laughs> Benvenuto. Bienvenidos. Uh, bonjour. I'm done. I am John Racanelli, uh, and I'm the director of the aquarium. And I'm, uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight to our Marjorie Lynn Bank lecture series. And uh, and I want to say a couple words before I introduce uh, a, a, an important partner and friend of ours, and then eventually I'll get around to introducing our speaker. Um, the Marjorie Lynn Bank lecture series has been going on here at the National Aquarium for quite a number of years. And many of you may know that Marjorie, and I, it was great talking to Brian who, who knew Marjorie. I only knew her by virtue of the fact that I was a you know, young puppy of a diver reading Skin Diver and uh, Ocean Realm and Underwater USA and seeing these great photos that she took. Uh, but she was a photojournalist, naturalist, explorer, diver, Baltimore bred, b born and bred, um, uh, got interested in the undersea world at a young age, got certified at a very young age, and eventually traveled the world as a professional photojournalist. So it is highly apropos that, uh, that one of those who has carried on that tradition in a very, very large way is going to be speaking to you tonight. Uh, Marjorie left the world all too soon and in the 90s, and her family wonderfully endowed this great lecture series and has made it possible to uh, continue this tradition. Now, this year, under the leadership of our new, well, I think we can still call Eric new at the job, uh, Chief Conservation Officer Eric Schwab and his team, we've begun an important new partnership with the series, uh, coupled with the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation and the NOAA's uh, U.S. Marine Sanctuary, uh, Office of Marine Sanctuaries, to focus on special places and their champions and special ocean places in their champions. And one of those champions is going to be speaking with you tonight. Um, and the purpose really is to give you a glimpse into the wonder under the water uh, and also learn about contemporary ocean issues that we all face and that we know we need to respond to through the eyes and through the words and images of an incredible group of ocean experts like Brian. And you'll meet him soon if you can get me off the stage. So. <laughs> Uh, we kicked off the series last month with uh, a friend and, and mentor and, um, and hero of many of ours, Dr. Sylvia Earle, who, who spoke about her hope spots, and, uh, and, and Brian is going to carry on that tradition. <clears throat> How many people were here last week, uh, last month? How many people saw Sylvia? Oh, great. Okay. Wonderful. Um, before I do, though, I'd like to first of all recognize uh, uh, our staff and volunteers. Many of our volunteers are here tonight. I love that. Bravo. We love you guys. Keep going. <laughs> and we've also got a uh, one of our board members for the National Aquarium in Baltimore, and that's Jim Shea. Give a wave, Jim, and his wonderful partner, Sarah. And the last thing I wanted to say was that, uh, well, I'll talk more about the upcoming talks in a little while, but um, before I introduce our speaker, I, I'd like to invite uh, a good friend um, who... Uh, whose institution has been a huge and important friend to us and to our, our world uh, for a long time, and that is the Smithsonian Museum, National Museum of Natural History. Um, and Barbara Stauffer is public engagement strategist, chief of temporary exhibitions, um, and she's going to speak for a few moments about one of my most favorite museums on earth and an amazing exhibition that's now going on there. So would you join me up here for a moment, Barbara? Hello. <laughs> so thank you, John, and thank you to the National Aquarium for inviting me here and um, giving me a chance to just say a few words. What I'd like to do, or the reason I'm here, is because I had the great fortune of working with Brian on an exhibition. And that exhibition is now on view at the Museum of Natural History. And I'm here to encourage you not just to go see the exhibition, but also to participate in it, take part in it. Um, now, the, I will say that the exhibit will be up until 2015. We're not entirely sure when in 2015 it will close. And 2015 may seem like a long time away, but if you're like me, 
uh, time will rush by, so don't delay. Go see it. Um, it's really wonderful to see Brian's photos kind of blown up large scale in our um, Sand Ocean Hall. And an important feature of the show is that you can contribute to it as well. Um, when I first met with Brian to talk about doing the exhibition, I just knew from talking to him, I just knew that he would be willing to try some things out and a great person to work with. And he did work with us. Um, one section of the exhibition was kind of open to crowd curation. And so five photos in the portraits of a vanishing world section were selected by online and on-site visitors. In addition, that section features a screen with a rotating gallery of images, all of which have been submitted to our Flickr group and then selected by Brian and some of the exhibit team. And that process is still going on. Actually, let me make sure you have the information. Um, the next selection from the Flickr group will be made in the next couple of months. And at this point, I'd just like to make sure that everybody knows of this opportunity, encourage you to submit photos, encourage family, friends, neighbors to do so as well. And for all you know, who knows, um, your photo might be in the exhibit gallery. So it's been a wonderful pleasure to work with Brian, and it's a delight to be able to display his photos at the museum. And I hope that you'll come see the exhibition, submit some photos, and continue the dialogue with Brian, National Aquarium, and with us in the next coming years. Thank you. So uh, I, I did insist that I would come back up to, um, uh, to, to mention uh, a, a couple of words about uh, Brian because uh, you know, it's funny, I, I, I think of him as a great photographer, but I also think of him as a dive buddy. And, and I reminded him a few minutes ago of the, the first time we actually met. It was, uh, I think it was 2008 or 9. Was, and uh, it was off of uh, the Yucatan in a place called Holbosch. Has anybody here ever been to Holbosch, Mexico? Holbosch actually means in uh, Maya, it means black hole. And when I first heard that, I thought, uh-oh. It's kind of sounded like a really uncomfortable place, but it's really just named after the cenotes, the sinkholes, uh, which we now think of as blue holes. Um, and that is a remarkable place on Earth uh, where whale sharks aggregate to feed on fish larvae in huge, huge numbers. I mean billions of fish larvae, larvae which you don't see, and upwards of 275 whale sharks, which you do see, because these guys are the size of buses, and Brian will show you some incredible images of that. But the part that I think is the best uh, anecdote about that is that I think the first time I saw him, I got in the water and swam over. It's all happening on the surface. These are 40-foot fish, harmless to people. They're, they're feeding on tiny eggs. And there was Brian getting an incredible shot. Now, to get that incredible shot, he was floating in the water column right in front of this whale shark that was coming at him at about four or five knots with this mouth that's big enough to swim right into. And, you know, no teeth, just rakers, but it wouldn't go well if you ended up inside it. <laughs> and I was floating there too, but then as the shark got about a boat length away, a shark length away, I started wheeling out of the picture. Not this guy. He stayed there until he got the shot and then did some, you know, pirouette and five wheel kicks and like a matador dodged out of the way, but that was my first view of Brian, and of course, uh, I, I, I give him a lot of grief because um, I think the guy's name was Rodolfo or something, was running the boat that we were on, and his job was to sort of spot the whale sharks and then let Brian know, but he just didn't get the words right, so his, his, he ended up renaming you Brian. <laughs> so I, whenever I see Brian, I always say, Brian! Uh, through his stunning photography, though, Brian um, has been an incredible advocate for the oceans. Um, he is a strong supporter of and, and promoter of our national marine sanctuaries and, and marine reserves, hope spots all over the world. And he has witnessed both the hope and the risks, the dangers that these places face. Um, I hope that you'll get to uh, this fabulous portraits of an ocean, portraits of a planet, of planet ocean at the, uh, at the Smithsonian, at the Natural History Museum. And uh, with that, I'd like you to join me in a, in a very warm Baltimore welcome for this great, great 
friend of the ocean, Brian Scarry. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, John. Thank you, Barbara. And thank you all. Everyone ready to go for a swim? You know that's part of the deal, right? That after the talk, we're all going to do a little dive in the harbor. Or the, the haba, as I say, from Boston. I actually just flew home to Boston yesterday from Mexico. And um, Boston, of course, is not only my home, but you may know it's also home to the world champion Boston Red Sox. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I said that in Canada on a lecture once when the Bruins won the Stanley Cup, and I thought I was going to get killed. Um, anyway, well, it's a great pleasure to be back in Baltimore and particularly at the uh, National Aquarium. It's been a few years since I've been here and you've done wonders with the place, John. It's, uh, it's really amazing, absolutely stunning. If, I'm sure most of you have seen all the exhibits and the new Indo-Pacific um, black tip reef, but that was absolutely amazing when I got a little tour of that today. And just the amount of work that goes in to get something like that so perfect is incredible. It's, it's truly like being there. Um, but what I wanted to share with you this evening are some of my experiences in the sea through my work as a photojournalist, um, beginning with how I approach photography, the things that I think about when I head off on assignment, and then taking you with me on assignment and introducing you to some of the interesting characters I've met along the way. Talking about the animals here, the other characters will have to wait for a different lecture. But, um, you know, I suppose like many photographers, when I first began, I just wanted to make beautiful pictures of the places that interested me or the animals that interested me. But there's been somewhat of an evolution in my career in that over time, I began to see a lot of problems occurring in our world's oceans, things that may not be evident to most people unless you're slipping your head beneath the waves on a regular basis. You might not know about these things. So as a journalist, I felt a, a sense of responsibility and a sense of urgency to begin turning my cameras towards these things. So I wanted to share some of these problems in the ocean this evening as well, but I also wanted to end with hope because I do believe there is plenty of reason for hope and that it's certainly not too late. So um, the title of the program is Ocean Soul, which is also the name of my latest book, my monograph, um, which I think we'll have here later. But um, you know, whenever I have a captive audience, uh, I like to begin with pictures of myself as a child. <laughs> I'm sure that's all why, uh, why you all came here tonight to see this kind of stuff. But, um, but this is actually where it sort of all began for me, you know, when I was about five or six years old in my parents' backyard swimming pool up in Massachusetts, uh, dreaming about becoming an ocean explorer. Um, incidentally, I think something happened when we scanned this old photo, the date at the bottom.
the surface, about 72% is ocean, is, is water, and that's true. But I think an even more important statistic is that 98% of the biosphere, 98% of the livable, habitable planet where life can exist is water. So it's certainly in our best interest to learn more about this place and to protect it. Um, my, my work then, an ocean soul, is, is about exploring this watery world photographically. It's a personal story about trying to figure out what's going on down there, trying to peel back the layers of, of mystery that exist with ecosystems and animals and trying to make sense of it all. And incidentally, is it just me or does anyone else think the fish on the cover of this book looks like J. Edgar Hoover? <laughs> Don't you think? Just a little? <laughs> but I digress. So as I was saying, um, my work is about trying to figure out what's going on in the ocean and tell stories about that stuff. And, you know, I've had the the pleasure. I've been very fortunate over my career to work with many great scientists along the way and I've I've learned an awful lot from them over those years. This is a colleague of mine, Enrique Sala, hovering over a newly discovered species or compact flashcards, film, so we're relegated to whatever we take in the ocean. But despite those brief forays into the sea, I've learned that if I can just spend time, things will be revealed. You know, so many times I, I find myself going off on assignment to a place I've never been before, and I don't really understand what's happening. There's sort of just chaos all around me. There's fish swirling all about, and I don't really know where to begin. But what I've learned to do to tell these stories visually is to focus on one scene or one behavior at a time that sort of leads me into these worlds. It could be a simple thing like a little yellow go-
of the reef. And both of those places, mangroves and reefs, need seagrass beds as well. If you just spend time in, in any one of these places, you'll sort of see animals ebbing and flowing between them. They, they move you know, during the time of the day. They go places to feed. But they, they need all three. So we can't just protect one or just focus on one. And my story also focused on some very special wildlife events, things that happen like what John was referring to, this aggregation of whale sharks. This is off a place called Isla Mujeres in the Yucatan of Mexico, and it's the largest gathering of the largest fish in the world. There's about 400 whale sharks that come here in the summertime to feed on fish eggs and plankton. This is an aerial photo that shows about six of them. And if we drop down from the high altitude, in front of the business end of one of these animals. This is uh, probably the picture John was talking about, um, where one of these whale sharks is sort of coming at you with big open mouth. But as he also mentioned, not much to fear because they, they don't eat people. They just eat plankton and fish eggs. Uh, there's a remora actually tempting fate there swimming inside the animal's mouth. So this was out in the blue water off Isla Maharis, but as John mentioned, near uh, Isla Holbosh, where we were actually based, the water is greener and a little bit cooler, more temperate. Um, but a very interesting backdrop, and I loved working in these waters too. This was a whale shark that had this sort of living wreath of bait fish around its head, and I made these pictures just by snorkeling, no scuba, but you know, you have to do a lot of swimming to sort of get up in front of them. They don't appear to be moving that fast, but they, but they certainly are. But you know, it's not just the big guys that are interesting, it's the little guys too in a, re in, in a reef ecosystem like this. And that's what I wanted the story to show as well, that everything depends on each other and that the little guys, like this little blenny that's poking its head out of some hard coral to feed, can be just as interesting as the, the biggest animals out there. I photographed all kinds of fish throughout the Mesoamerican Reef. This was a school of black margate that I found hovering up in the water column one day. I was sort of inching my way closer, trying to get just close enough, and they sort of have an expression that seems to be saying, you know, all right, scary, one inch closer and we're out of here. But... Um, I was able to get the picture and move on. And as you may also know, one of the real threats to the Caribbean, and particularly the Mesoamerican Reef, has been the invasion of lionfish, which is a beautiful animal uh, that has these toxic spines on its back. It's a beautiful animal that's native to the Pacific. Somehow it was introduced into the Atlantic, and it has exploded. And the problem is that it it predates on the, the juvenile species of, of other animals, of other fish. It, it just eats them, the little fish. And there hasn't been a real solution to this problem. You know, in some places they encourage divers to spear them, which has been effective. But overall, it hasn't really done much to control the population. But in Honduras, I uh, was working with a shark biologist who had spent the last couple of years training the wild Caribbean reef sharks out there to acquire a taste for a lionfish. We see one having a little lionfish lunch uh, right here. He would spear them initially and get them to you know, acquire this taste, and then over time they began to predate naturally. And in that area of Cordelia Banks, the lionfish population had gone down substantially. They, they were naturally predating on them out there. So pretty, um, pretty interesting. Um, there was also an event that I wanted to photograph in the Sunset, they rise up in a massive column with as many as 10,000 fish creating a living volcano maybe 150 feet high. As they near the surface, they release their spawn and melt that form giant clouds. And while all this frenzy is happening, whale sharks move in to feed on the fish eggs. They know exactly when this is going to happen, how they know it, nobody knows. But they, they arrive at this precise location in an event that encompasses astronomy, biology, and oceanography. Photographically, it's a real challenge to capture because everything is moving so fast. The light levels are low and the fish are highly reflective. It's like trying to photograph fast swimming mirrors. And as quickly as it all happens, it's over. And then again, it begins somewhere else, maybe 100 meters away, and there I am swimming through the water trying to capture it one more time. 
So my interest was in making a single still frame, a still photo that would somehow capture this frenzy of activity that's probably better seen on video. But after many nights of sort of dragging my butt onto the boat without any success, I was able to make a single picture that sort of did, you know, translate to readers what was happening here. All those giant fish there, 90 pound, 100 pound snapper, the, the spawn and the milk and some divers in the background for, uh, for a little bit of scale. There's also a little side story that I thought I'd share with you about my time in Gladden's Spit. Before I left to go out there, I was in the Galapagos on another trip, and there was the executive director of an NGO who was there. And when he heard that I was going to Gladden's Spit to photograph this, this event, he said, oh, well, you know, we're sending um, January Jones, the actress, who's a big shark conservationist, to, to do some swimming with whale sharks there to talk about advocacy for your whale sharks. He said, would you like to photograph January while you're there? So I said, um... <laughs> Well, yes, I would, I said, but, um, but I'm going to be on assignment for National Geographic, so I, I really can't do that. So for those of you who don't know January, she's the actress on the TV show Mad Men, and, and she's done feature films, of course, in Hollywood. So um, I had my own little sailboat out there, a 60-foot sailboat, and I was anchored up one day with my crew, and sure enough, January comes out in her, her boat, and she comes over and introduces herself and says, um, would you like to you know, come back to a private dinner tonight? I'm hosting back on land. To which I say, no thanks, January. I should really stay out here with my crew. So, so this is all the evidence we need, I believe, to prove that 35 years of diving is detrimental to the human brain. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, moving on. Um, so those spawning snapper that we saw actually do pick a very precise place in the ocean to engage in that procreative dance. And the fertilized eggs then get taken by currents and brought inshore to mangroves. This is a mangrove just very, very close uh, in shallow water to where that mating event took place. This was a very calm morning, kind of a mirror reflection on these mangrove roots, the trees growing out of the water. But those are the baby snapper. These are the baby snapper that hatch here in sort of a protected place where there's no big predators to really come in and harm them. And as they get a little bit bigger in the months to come, they'll go out in the reef and compete as an adult. But, you know, it all works very, very well together. It's a well-tuned machine, and when any one part gets out of whack, then things begin to, to fall apart. I also worked in, um, in some deeper water mangroves out here, kind of a spooky place. Um, but it was very interesting. This particular day, I think it had rained the night before, and there was sort of this interesting uh, freshwater lens up near the surface that created kind of a three-color, tricoloration to the background. And... Um, you know, places like this that are deep water are not only home to the little guys, the little juvenile guys, they're also home to some bigger guys like these saltwater crocodiles that I photographed in some of these lagoons and, and mangroves as well. This is the American crocodile, which is actually an endangered uh, creature because of loss of habitat. But, you know, diving with or swimming with saltwater crocs is not like anything else. It's not like sharks or anything. These guys, when they, when they get a bead on you, when they see you, you are food to them. And that's just it. Um, you know, and it's days like that that I'm especially thankful that I always hire assistants that I can swim faster than. Uh, it's kind of a prerequisite, actually. Um, but that picture was made at the edge of a mangrove near dusk where the water was sort of dark. But I found a place in Mexico, Banco Chinchorro, where the crocs came out a little further away and the water was clearer. And there were tarpon and baitfish and snapper. And um, much more interesting, this was about a nine-foot saltwater croc here perched up on that little grassy area, which leads us to the next of these three key habitats, the seagrass beds. And, you know, these are places that divers often sort of just swim over to get out to the reef. But I would encourage divers to spend a little time here because they can be quite, quite interesting. Uh, this is another very calm morning where the mirror reflection of these little silver sides, the bait fish, were reflecting up above. But I had one of my greatest encounters out there. Um, these are animals. This is the rainbow parrotfish that we saw earlier. Uh, now feeding out there. So, you know, they do they do feed in, in, in their critical habitat. But as I said, one of the best um, experiences I had was with some manatees. Now, I had photographed manatees. I did a children's book about manatees in Florida. And those animals are much more acclimated to humans. They, they're much more accustomed and be, have become urban animals. But in Belize, they're still quite elusive and don't usually come close to, to humans. But this one particular morning, I found a very tolerant mom and calf here that sort of allowed me into their world. And it was, you know, obviously very privileged to be able to do this. Um, again, just using a mass snorkel and fin, no, no scuba. Um, we see a nursing calf here, nursing for mom. They're about to settle down into the sand. And then as the mother was feeding, they feed on seagrass. They eat just the, um, the roots. So the blades drift up over her head. She was foraging furiously and 
you know, created these big billowing clouds of mud while the, the calf was very tenderly perched on her back. Just a very tender moment. Again, out there, nobody around for miles um, in this very special place. But these are the stories that I think um, are important to tell and to show the value of these places. Another story that um, I did uh, not too long ago in National Geographic was a story about seamounts, which are underwater mountains. And we don't know a whole lot about seamounts, but we do know that there's far more mountains in the sea than there are on land, and that they are incredibly biodiverse areas. They have in, in tremendous biodiversity, largely because of upwellings, you know, oceanographic currents, because currents sort of bang into them in, in the middle of the ocean and they, they create all these, these beautiful areas for, for nutrients. So there's a lot of animals and we wanted to do a story to show the value of protecting these places because they're now being targeted by fishing fleets that are going down miles deep to catch fish that we know almost nothing about. So I worked in four locations worldwide, but I just wanted to share a couple with you tonight. The first being off the coast, the Pacific coast of Costa Rica. We went to a seamount that had been really unexplored. I think Sylvia Earle made one or two dives there before we got there, and I think we did about nine. Um, and we were using this little submarine. The summit of the seamount is at about five or 600 feet, so it was all done with uh, submersibles and ROVs. And I put together another little video that my other assistant did to show some of what happens on this project. It was just a 10-day project from soup to nuts, and we only had seven days on site. Shipped down about 60 cases of equipment to assemble and hope that everything went well. So National Geographic built two deep sea cameras for me, one that we the outside of the submersible and one that we could use on some remote operated vehicles from the University of Connecticut. So this is in Punta Arenas, Costa Rica, sailing by the fishing fleet. And we were absolutely blessed with fantastic weather, which almost never happens for me. But on this trip, we had just really flat, calm seas for seven days. Once you submerge yourself just below the surface, that, that hemisphere, that dome, sort of becomes invisible and it's kind of like just not being in anything. Um, the inside of the sub is air conditioned. It's a little tight, but um, otherwise you're quite comfortable. Some of the jellies and tina fours and things we would see on the way down. And then once you arrive on the bottom, it's a very lunar landscape, a very, very alien landscape that we just sort of hover over. That's the external camera there uh, with the strobes on it that we had mounted on the outside. And we would just sort of fly over these landscapes looking and exploring. So this is a, a photo that my assistant Lou Lamar made of me inside with uh, Dr. Greg Stone from Conservation International. Greg was the writer on this story. And as we're beginning our descent on one of these dives, which would take several minutes to get down to the summit, as I said, it was unexplored, so we never really knew what we
be the extinct caldera of a dormant volcano, this, this sort of cinder cone that was coming up. This is Greg Stone looking at one of the walls of that caldera that had collapsed, but the ROV Gila from the University of Connecticut is in the background exploring it as well. So I had this idea in my head. I wanted to make a picture of the submarine sort of descending into that opening of this dormant volcano, and I would have to do that with the ROV, which meant I'd have to be back on the ship um, about a quarter of a mile away. The, the two vehicles would be down at about 600 feet, and I'd have to work with an ROV pilot to sort of get everything right. And um, we were able to, to sort of do it. This is the sub deep sea beginning to enter into that caldera. This is the picture that was used as the lead picture in the story in the magazine and the cover in, in a number of countries. But we lit it inside too. I had some lights inside um, to illuminate um, Dr. Larry Maiden from Woods Hole and Greg Stone in the sub and I was up on the ship trying to do this. And you know, it was like a three-dimensional chess game because there were currents down there and I was on a radio to the pilot saying, you know, turn this light on, turn that light off and, and try to get it all right. But in the end, it ended up working. Um, I think those guys were down there for about three hours. It was the first time they used the, the pee bag. On the uh, on the sub, so um, we're kind of proud of that. But um, but <clears throat> and then they settled down here, kind of a bird's eye view on that place where that wall collapsed. But you know, this is the future of ocean exploration. Uh, about 95% of the ocean remains unexplored. So it's going to be this kind of stuff and 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 beyond uh, that we're going to be doing in the in the time ahead. Which means it's an exciting time for ocean exploration. So from the Pacific coast of Costa Rica, we go to about 100 miles off the coast of San Diego, California, to a place called Cortez Banks, another seamount, actually more of a mountain range out there. Um, it's a place that's quite infamous for bad weather. It's where they historically or regularly have 80 to 100 foot waves where surfers like Laird Hamilton go out there to, to surf these 80 footers. But again, we just somehow, divine intervention, we had great, great flat seas. And as you approach Cortez Banks, that's all you see is that little buoy on the surface. And as you get closer, the sea lions use it as a haul out. So we got a big male bull California sea lion here with his harem. And um, so it was alive. But if, if you poke your head just a few inches below the surface, it comes alive underwater too. It's a kelp forest uh, ecosystem. And the kelp just grows right up to the surface from about 60 or 70 feet below. These are some half moon fish, planktivores, that were feeding up near the surface on plankton. But if you drop down you know, to the very bottom, it's like an enchanted forest, this amazingly beautiful garden. It was one of the first days I was out there. We had about 100 foot visibility. And even on a calm day like this, it's, there's always a bit of surge. So I'd sort of wrap my leg around a, a rock or something to hold steady to, to make some pictures. But it really was um, like being in, in a storybook, you know, going, going through the pages of a storybook with this stunning scene. Um, a very primal sort of place as well. This is an animal known as a Pacific torpedo ray, a relative of the shark. But this guy can deliver a 45 volt. Uh, jolt of electricity, actually, so you don't want to get too close to them. And um, some days I worked off in the deeper water with their bigger cousins, like the mako shark. This was a stunning female mako that spent about an hour with me out there in the blue water one day. Uh, really beautiful animal. Those are parasites on her dorsal fin there uh, at top. But back on the seamount proper, I saw stuff that I hadn't seen before. This was something called surf grass, which is a type of grass that only grows in areas of high current, which is indicative of a, of a seamount, which again, as I explained, is, is part of the reason the biodiversity is so great. And these fish are called sheep's head, which were common along the California coast. But from friends of mine who live there, they say you never see them this big anymore. They've all been fished out. So you got to go 100 miles offshore in order to find anything like this, which was quite beautiful. And um, you know, at the end of one of my last days, I was able to spend some time up in the kelp canopy with this beautiful little juvenile harbor seal that was a little standoffish at first, but then came over and was biting my fins and hugging my, uh, my strobes and stuff, so he became sort of my buddy. Uh, well, you know, having experiences like this is, is really addictive. I, um, I, I sometimes think of my career as just being one string of extraordinary encounters after another, and even after, you know, 35 years of diving and, and 16 with the magazine, I never cease to be amazed at what I, I see out there. I know that if I go out to sea or spend time underwater, I will see extraordinary things. But in the years that I've been doing this, I've also begun more frequently to see some horrible things as well. As I mentioned in my opening remarks, things that may not be apparent to most folks. So I feel it's important to tell those stories as well. One of the first sort of big natural history stories that I did for National Geographic where I recognized the ability to include environmental themes within the broader context of a, of a natural history coverage was a story about harp seals. Now harp seals are true Arctic animals. They spend most of their life in the Canadian Arctic. 
But for a few weeks each year in February and March, they migrate down to the Gulf of St. Lawrence, sort of near Newfoundland. And during those few weeks, they engage in courtship, in mating, and in pupping if the females had become pregnant from the year before. And all of that drama is played out against the backdrop of transient pack ice that moves with wind and tide. So that was the story that I initially wanted to tell. Just a, a brief glimpse of this life cycle, or this few weeks in their life cycle, annual cycle, that would you know, show readers what was happening with these animals. Um, and I looked at some photos that photographers had done of harp seals in the past on the surface, and I learned that they had done those by going out with a helicopter, landing on the ice, spending a few hours and then having to be back before dark. So I had the idea to use a 65-foot steel-hulled crab fishing boat that we would use like an icebreaker to break through the ice and I could live out there for weeks at a time and hopefully see interesting behaviors, things that, that I might not otherwise see in brief forays out there like the harp seal kiss where the, the mom will sniff her pup before each feeding to make sure she's feeding only, only her pup. These animals have the second fastest weaning in the animal kingdom. They go from being completely helpless on day one to being uh, what's known as a fat white coat on day 14. About two weeks, they're completely ready to go into the sea. Their mother pretty much begins to leave them alone at that point, and it's at that time they, they test out those flippers, making their first dives in the 28.5 degree water, very, very chilly water. They, they sort of bob up and down like a cork in the beginning, but pretty quickly they, they get the hang of it and begin to swim. And, you know, these were photos that had never been made before. This is a pup making its very first solo swim beneath, beneath the ice shelf as mom sort of proudly watches from, from the back there, like watching your kids ride their bike for the first time maybe. And, you know, I was, I was happy with the way things were going, and I thought this was the story we wanted to tell. But as I got more involved in the story, I did it over two seasons, um, we realized, me and my editors, that we, we couldn't ignore two very large environmental issues if we were going to tell this story properly. And the first was that these animals continued to be hunted. It's actually the largest mass hunting or slaughter of marine mammals on the planet with hundreds of thousands of um, seal pups being killed just for their coats so that hats and mittens and jackets can be made. Um, they use this hackapec to kill them and uh, they, they wait just till the the white coat is shed at about 15 or 16 days old. I became the first journalist in 17 years to get aboard one of these hunting boats. I was given some restrictions as to what I could shoot. But here you see one of the hunters dragging back one of those, those animals. And as, as disturbing as this is, and it is quite troubling, I think the bigger problem moving forward for these animals will be the loss of sea ice due to climate change. This is a photo I made from a helicopter looking at the Gulf of St. Lawrence during harp seal season, February and March. And even though we see a lot of ice in this picture, we see a lot of water as well. And the ice that is there is quite thin. And the problem is those pups need a stable platform from which to nurse from their moms. They only need 14 days, as I said. But if they don't get it, they can fall through the ice and they're not prepared and they'll die. And this image shows exactly that thing happening where a pup that was only about five or six days old still had a little piece of the umbilical cord, that red thing on its belly has fallen through this very slushy ice, and the mother is frantically pushing it back up to breathe and, and get back to stable purchase. So, you know, in the time that I was up there, this was about 10 years ago or so, I saw a number of pups that didn't make it, and I saw a number that did, like this one here. But in more recent times, I've talked to researchers and, and read some papers that the ice conditions have gotten worse and worse, and there have been some years where there was no ice, and the pup mortality rate had increased to 100%. So going forward, you know, this is the kind of thing these animals are going to have to contend with. Um, they may go extinct or they may adapt, I don't know, but those were the stories, or a story that I thought was important to tell in terms of what was happening in the ocean in regards to climate change. This became a cover story at National Geographic and it received quite a bit of attention and with that I saw the ability to begin doing other stories as well. So sort of on the heels of the harp seal story, I proposed a story on something called the global fish crisis, which is really just the problem of overfishing, taking too many fish from the ocean. And I came to this story for two reasons really. One, because I had personally seen far fewer fish in the places I used to see many, but I also around this time read a scientific paper that was published in the British British journal Nature that stated that 90% of the big fish in the ocean have disappeared in the last 50 or 60 years post World War II because of industrialized commercial overfishing. We're talking about the sharks, the billfish, and the tuna. And when I read that, I said, you know, 90% of the big fish in the ocean are gone. This is going to be headline news in every media outlet. But it really wasn't. It didn't get much play. So I proposed it to the Geographic, and, and the editors embraced it. And then it was a question of how am I going to tell this story? 
And I spent about two years on it, but I knew that I didn't want it to be like a traditional underwater pretty picture story. I wanted it to be more like war photography. I wanted to go out and make pictures that showed readers what was happening in marine wildlife around our planet that this was not like other things that we eat, other forms of agriculture, that this was the, the, the harvesting, if we can use that word, of, of wildlife. It's really unprecedented in many respects. But one of the key components or foundation elements of this story that I thought was essential was what I called wildlife appreciation. I wanted people to have some appreciation for the animals that we might be consuming. You know, I think when we go to a restaurant with friends and somebody orders a steak, we all know where steak comes from. And Somebody else orders chicken, and we know what a chicken is. But when you're eating bluefin tuna sushi, I wondered how many people had any appreciation of the magnificent creature that we're consuming. This is a school of bluefin that I photographed in the Mediterranean off Spain. I actually have a story in the current issue of National Geographic, the March issue, on bluefin, just on bluefin tuna. But, you know, these are animals that have no terrestrial counterpart. There's nothing like them on the planet. These are animals that continue to grow their entire life. If we weren't so efficient at catching them, there'd be 30-year-old bluefin out there that weigh a ton. They don't get anywhere near that big these days. These are animals that can generate heat in their body, effectively a warm-blooded fish. And because of that, they can swim practically from the equator to the poles in search of their prey. They crisscross entire oceans in the course of a year. They've been studied by naval engineers for torpedo design, but they swim faster than a torpedo. They were revered by cavemen who painted pictures on their walls, and early philosophers like Plato wrote about them and mused about their wanderings. And today, they're on the verge of extinction because of this lust for sushi. This is the Skiji fish market in Tokyo, where every single day, 365 days a year, the tuna are stacked up like cordwood and auctioned off. You know, I got special permission to do this, but as I wandered around and, and, and looked at what was happening there, it sort of occurred to me that the ocean is not a grocery store. We can't continue to take at these unsustainable levels and expect everything to be okay. It won't be. It won't be okay. I also wanted to show some of the methods that fish are caught, because again, it's not on people's radar, it's not what we think about, but it's very different than other things that we eat. This is the most common method of fishing in the world, it's something called a trawl, a, a trawl net. And this one's a bottom trawl that was being used in Mexico to catch shrimp. And the way this works is you've got a big net with floats at the top and a lead weighted line on the bottom and two big steel doors on either end. And this entire assembly is towed behind a boat and when those doors meet resistance with the water it opens the mouth, mouth of the net. And as you can imagine, it's very effective at catching whatever the intended species is. But as you can also see, it's very effective at indiscriminately catching everything else in its path. And because this is a bottom trawl, it's scraping the bottom. It's effectively clear-cutting the precious benthic level where all this other stuff is living down there that they don't want, but they're going to catch in the process. The shrimp just get tossed into the net along with everything else. This is a photo that shows the, the fisherman's hands holding the shrimp that he caught after towing that net for one hour. And all those other animals in the background, those are dead on the deck of his boat. That's called bycatch. These are animals that have no commercial value that are caught in the process and will be thrown back into the sea as trash. So this is the true cost of a shrimp dinner in many parts of the world, about seven or eight shrimp and 12 pounds of other animals that die in the process. And to make that point even more visual, I swam under the shrimp boat as they were shoveling that bycatch back into the sea and photographed this cascade of death, you know, animals like guitarfish and bat rays, baby flounder, that only an hour before were alive on the bottom of the ocean. So this is what I wanted readers to understand. I also spent time while working on this story in the shark fishing industry because I wanted readers to have some grasp of the fact that today on planet Earth, even in 2014, more than 100 million sharks are killed every single year. Think about that number, 100 million sharks. We can't kill 100 million apex predators and expect any ecosystem to be healthy because it won't be, and it's not. But as I went out to photograph this component of the story, I sort of wrestled with the notion of how do you make a picture of a dead shark that will resonate with readers. You know, I think there's still a misconception that sharks are dangerous or monsters or the only good shark is a dead shark. So I photographed a number of images that were technically fine and would have worked in the story. But it was one morning when I jumped in in the Sea of Cortez and, and saw this thresher shark that had just died in a gill net and its eye was still open. And because it's a pelagic animal, lives out in the open ocean, it had these huge pectoral fins. And as I began to frame it up in my camera's viewfinder, it sort of struck me as a crucifixion. And I thought that maybe this would give some empathy to that issue of 100 million sharks. It actually became the lead picture in the cover story in 2007. But it's had a life beyond that. It's been used by conservation groups. And two years ago, I actually received a, a call from the president of Chile who wanted to use this in a PowerPoint presentation to his government. And I learned later that year that Chile had banned shark finning. 
So I think these are the kinds of pictures that the conservation movement needs. We're visual creatures, and we respond to these kinds of pictures, I think, if we can just you know, produce them. Around the same time, I did another more celebratory story about sharks, because I love sharks. I love photographing them, and I wanted to use this as a vehicle to also hammer home the need for conservation. But I wanted to photograph several species, and I looked at the, the globe, and I realized that there wasn't many places on the planet where I could go to photograph sharks in terms of multiple species because they were in real trouble. But I ended up going to the Bahamas because the Bahamas was a place that, due to its natural geography, lent itself to many different species of sharks. But it also was a place that was very progressive in terms of protecting sharks. Recently, they've actually protected all sharks throughout the Bahamian waters. At the time I was doing the story, there was several levels of protection in place. But what I wanted to do is, you know, show readers the value of sharks. I began my coverage at the world's most popular dive resort, a place called Stewart Coves, owned by this guy in the chainmail suit, Stewart Cove, um, that, you know, gets about 50,000 divers and snorkelers to come to his place every year. And the reason he gets so many is because he does these shark encounters where you can go down in shallow water and he'll feed the Caribbean reef sharks that come in. And, you know, you could argue that feeding wild animals is not a good idea, and I would certainly agree with that. But it wasn't that long ago that they were killing sharks here, so maybe as sort of a transition step, this might be a, an okay thing. You know, photographically, it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity to get close to these Caribbean reef sharks that'll come right in and bounce their nose off your dome port. But as interesting as that was, I wanted to get further afield. I wanted to go out and photograph some of the more wild species that we hadn't seen in the magazine anyway very much, like the tiger shark. I'd spent nearly 20 years of my life trying to find a place where I could get pictures of tiger sharks with no success, but a friend of mine from Palm Beach, Florida, who runs a dive business, discovered a place that he calls Tiger Beach in the northern Bahamas, where on any given day, you can find um, about a dozen or more of these big old tiger sharks. It's very shallow, it's only about 18 or 20 feet deep with turtle grass and white sand on the bottom. And the sharks will come in super close. This one coming in real close. Sometimes they get a little too close, uh, like this one here. Um, but um, still, it's you know the point of this picture, I think, is that they um, this shark could have easily eaten my camera or eaten me, but he he didn't or she didn't. She was just sort of testing it and then moved on. And the truth is, I um, I actually resist the the temptation to make these kinds of scary pictures because I think it just perpetuates the myth of sharks as monsters, and that's not what I'm trying to do. And I was able to make an, uh, an image this one day that was used in the story that I liked a lot better. Uh, there was this beautiful female tiger shark swimming over the bottom. She was about 12 feet long, and she had these three little silver bar jacks swimming off her nose, this sort of symbiotic relationship, and she began to ascend up toward the surface. So I did the same thing and was getting closer and closer. You've got to be close to get the picture, and, you know, it's always a little dicey. This is technically the, the most dangerous shark species in tropical waters, the second most dangerous after the great white. But when I got within about maybe three feet or so, she just sort of turned, and I was able to make this portrait where the fish created a, a shadow on her face, a little shark ta a fish tattoo there on her, on her snout. But, you know, to me it was a, a gentler, more respectful kind of image that just shows these animals not as a monster as they've been portrayed, but as just one very important part of the ecosystem in which they live. I also spent time with baby sharks in this story because you don't often see that part of the story, but it also is a critical part of the equation. I went to the island of Bimini to work with baby lemon sharks that spend the first two years of their lives in these mangrove nurseries. This is a picture of me that my assistant made of me just laying in these mangrove swamps with just a wetsuit and a mask and snorkels, about 110 degrees and very buggy, lots of mosquitoes. But, you know, I was waiting for them to build up their courage and come closer. And eventually, as I slipped my head beneath the surface, I was able to make pictures like this that show a baby lemon shark that's only about a foot long swimming in about 12 inches deep water. Very important habitat. I learned after I left this place that some of these mangroves had been bulldozed so that a golf course could be made. And uh, fortunately, not all of it, and they're trying to protect it now as a marine reserve. So hopefully that'll happen because it's the only critical shark habitat nursery like this for about 150 miles around. I also worked with the great hammerhead shark on this story, an animal that as recently as maybe 10 or 12 years ago there were no pictures of because they were so elusive. But the same friend of mine from Florida discovered a place in wintertime where we could predictably find great hammerheads. And at the time, this was the only place we could do it, and, and you'd have to go out in sort of the open water. And the weather was bad in the winter. So in 18 days that I spent trying to do this, I only had two days where the conditions were good enough. But this was a big male, about a 14-foot male, coming in just below the surface at sunset. 
um, and I was able to make this photo. But the truth of the matter is, you know, these are animals. Hammerheads in the Atlantic, in general, have uh, declined in population by about 89 percent in the last 20 or 30 years. We're losing them faster than we can learn about them. We don't know where these animals migrate to or from, where they mate, where they have their pups, and yet they're down 89 percent. I also worked with the oceanic white tip shark, an animal that's considered the fourth most dangerous species if you pay attention to such lists, but it's an animal that's considered to be 98 percent in decline throughout most of its range worldwide. It's on the verge of extinction. Uh, at the time I, I, I did this story, I didn't know anybody who had seen one in the Bahamas in about 20 or 30 years, but we got some reports from sport fishermen down at a place called Cat Island who said that as they were reeling in yellowfin tuna on rod and reel, they said oceanic white tips were stealing them off the line. So based sort of on that fish tail, I decided to charter the boat and we went down for 16 days. And in 16 days, we only had one encounter. Um, turns out we were there at the wrong time of the year and you can see more if you go at a different time now. But I brought along a shark cage because we weren't going to be on the bottom and you know, we needed some sort of point of refuge. This is Wes Pratt, a shark biology, uh, biologist from Moat Marine Lab in Florida. And obviously the biologist was smarter than the photographer because he was inside the cage. But, um, but the truth is she was quite polite as all the other sharks I've shown you here tonight were and she just settled down into doing these big lazy circles and, um, until the light levels left. Well, it was just a couple other stories that I wanted to share with you tonight briefly. And the first one is a story I did on right whales, R-I-G-H-T, right whales, um, which were named the right whales by the early whalers because they were considered the right whale to kill. They moved slow and they floated after they were dead. But essentially the story of right whales is this, that about a million years ago, there was one species of right whale on the planet. But as land masses moved around and oceans became isolated, they got separated too. And today we have essentially two main species. We have the southern right whale that you see here, and we have the North Atlantic right whale that you see here, mom and calf that I photographed off of Florida. Both species were hunted to the brink of extinction back in the 1600s by those early whalers. But the southern right whale that we saw in the previous picture has rebounded much better it's still considered endangered, but it's done much better in terms of its numbers because it lives in places further away from human industrialization. This animal, the North Atlantic right whale, which lives from the Bay of Fundy, Canada to Florida, right along the eastern seaboard, right along here, is, has the dubious distinction of being the most endangered whale in the world. There's only about four or five hundred of these because they are urban whales. They live very close to urbanization and have to contend with all those urban ills. Things like pollution, that they scientists believe is affecting their reproduction and they get entangled in fishing gear and die because of that or they get struck by ships and die because of that. This is a close to the animals. It was really a roll of the dice, um, but we got very lucky. And from the moment I arrived, these animals were just super curious about me. They had never seen humans before, the researchers said, um, but they were all over me. I was diving alone with my dry suit. I didn't want my assistant or anybody else in the water because I was afraid we'd spook the animals. But, you know, right from the get-go, they were just super curious about, about me. Within a couple of days, I was making full-frame portraits of their, their soulful eyes. I should also mention that right whales have these white things on their head. They're, they're actually born with rough patches of skin in about the same place that humans have hair. So top of their head, over their eyes, and on their chin, and they get occupied by barnacles and these little crabs called cyamids, which give them shape and color. It's how researchers identify individual animals. But you know, photographically, this was just spectacular to be able to look into that eye that you knew was, was wondering what you were as well. On the, on the days when the visibility wasn't so good, I would drop down deeper and try to make silhouette pictures. This is uh, a male and female engaged in courtship, this beautiful giant ballet. I was careful to adjust the dry suit buoyancy. I didn't want to get between them. That would have been a very bad thing. Um, but, you know, after a few days of making some images, I, I had this picture in my mind uh, that I wanted to make of a, of a human with a whale. And I asked my assistant to come in the water with me on that day, never knowing if 
the whales would cooperate or, or what would happen. But as if on cue, this 45-foot, 70-ton right whale just swam down and spent about two hours with us that day. It was absolutely off the scale, better than any of my wildest dreams as a young boy, you know. I can remember swimming over the bottom, you know, I had maybe 110 pounds of equipment on and I was swimming and, and looking through the viewfinder and shooting and hoping I, I wasn't screwing it up and um, eventually I needed to catch my breath so I sort of knelt down in the sand and figured that that whale would just leave me in its wake but she actually turned and came back and looked at me with that big softball eye as if to say I know you can't swim very well, I'll wait for you. Um, and then, you know, I sort of caught my breath and moved on. This is also, incidentally, a, a good moment to give you some insight as to what it's like to work for National Geographic magazine. When I got back um, on the boat and, you know, the rest of I spent three weeks down there, I got back to the main island of New Zealand. I had to sort of shift gears. I flew to Honolulu, Hawaii. I was getting on a research ship to go out for another three weeks on a coral reef story expedition. And I was in my hotel room getting ready to check out, and I got an email from my editor, Kathy Moran, back in Washington. And she just, it was very cryptic. She just said, so, Brian, how did you do with the whales? So I all very proudly wrote back. I said, well, Kathy, you know, I think we got some stuff that nobody's ever seen before. And I, I attached the JPEG of this, this picture, sent it off to her. And I was anxious to get to the boat and check out of my hotel. But I was waiting for this email that I was certain was going to heap all this praise on me. And um, finally, I got this sort of very cryptic email back that just had five words that said, what else do you have? So, <laughs> so <laughs> it's not always quite so romantic. Um, so... I wanted to end tonight with um, with a story of hope. You know, I talked about um, in my opening remarks that 98% of the biosphere where animals can live on our planet is ocean, but less than a fraction of 1% is actually truly protected. Truly protected. Think about that. You know, on land we have many more national parks and protected places, but the ocean, which gives us life, three out of every four breaths that a human takes comes from the sea, the oxygen, and yet we've not treated it very well. So I think if we, if we want a healthy ocean and by virtue of a healthy planet, we need more marine protected areas, hope spots, sanctuaries, all of these things that we need to do and that we are beginning to do, but it's been slow progress. So around the same time that I did that global fisheries story, I wanted to do a solution story and I did a story on the value of marine protected areas. And I went to the country of New Zealand and they were at that time and still are quite progressive in terms of protecting their EEZ, their exclusive economic zone. And I really wanted this story to be just about a few things. I wanted it to be about abundance, about diversity, but mostly about resilience. I wanted to show that if we protected places in the ocean, they will come back. And when I first arrived there, I met with this gentleman, Dr. Bill Ballantyne who was a Brit, born in London, but moved early in his career to New Zealand. And he's sort of the father of marine protected areas. He's a mollusk scientist, so on any day when the weather's good, you'll find him on his hands and knees collecting data at this little place on the North Island called Goat Island, which is just not really an island. It's a rock off the coast there. But it was back in 1972 that Ballantyne somehow convinced the New Zealand government to protect this place as the first MPA, the first marine reserve. And I still don't know how he did it because, you know, he had to fight everybody. He had to fight uh, commercial fishermen who certainly didn't want any kind of regulation. He had to fight sport fishermen because a lot of people used to go here to fish off the rocks. And he even had to fight his fellow scientists because this was a popular place where the university would go to collect specimens. But somehow he did it. And he told me, he said, you know, Brian, when we protected it in 72, we thought that certain things would happen. For example, we thought certain species that had been overfished to the brink might return, like the New Zealand snapper that we see here. And they did. They returned both in size and in number. But he said other things happened that we couldn't predict. For example, the New Zealand snapper predates on sea urchins. It eats sea urchins. You see one with two in its mouth right here. Well, sea urchins eat kelp. So when the fish were wiped out, the urchins went crazy and ate all the kelp. So all anyone ever saw when they looked in this part of New Zealand in shallow water, 20, 30 feet of water, all they saw was what they called urchin barrens, kinna barrens, just acres and acres of urchins covering the boulders. Well, when the fish came back because of protection and control of the urchin population, lo and behold, you had the emergence of beautiful, lush, thick kelp forests in this place. You know, this is probably how it looked 500 years ago, but nobody's around to tell us. So, you know, the message is if we can create these places and protect them and leave them alone, they will restore themselves to a natural equilibrium and then we can use that as a baseline for conservation elsewhere. We can measure other places based on what we know in these protected places, which is critical. But what I found is, you know, not only the marine life returned, but people returned as well. These were two brothers 
whose mom and dad had driven them from Auckland that day, more than an hour's drive to come here. And they had passed by much more beautiful beaches, white sandy beaches on the way, but they came here because there was something to see. You know, it's, it's not rocket science. You know, we need that connection with nature. And if you create these places and they come back, you know, people will come. In fact, Valentine told me a very interesting thing. He said that in 1972, at the time that they protected this, about 3,000 people a year would go to this place, Goat Island. And most of them went there to fish off the rocks. And when they protected it, all the newspapers in New Zealand had big headlines that said, nothing left to do at Goat Island. Because they figured if you couldn't go fishing, there was nothing left to do. Well, fast forward now to today, 40 years later. Not 3,000 people, 300,000 people a year go there. 300,000 people go there just because there's something to see. Everywhere I worked in these marine reserves, I saw the same thing. In the South Island, in a beautiful place called Fiordland, it's a very shadowy sort of Lord of the Rings place where mountains have rivers that flow into the sea. This is the Camelot River. And that river is stained with tannin from all the vegetable matter up in the bush. And it creates a unique ecosystem in the ocean where a permanent layer about 25 feet thick of tannin stained freshwater sits on top of the ocean and blocks out a lot of the sunlight. So you get the emergence of deep water animals, things like black coral that actually looks white when it's alive and it looks like a tree, but it's an animal. These are animals, black coral, that you would normally find in the deep water, but this picture was made about 30 feet of water, 30 or 40 feet looking straight up because they're tricked into thinking it's deep because of that, that layer. Animals like sea pens, a type of coral that can move around. This picture made it about noontime or one o'clock on a bright sunny day, but looking horizontally, there's no ambient light. Very fragile world, but very beautiful, like a china closet that has been protected and is stunning because of that. Everywhere that I looked, you know, I played peekaboo with baby fur seals and fronds of kelp and went to the North Island where the water's a little warmer and bluer and swam with giant stingrays and underwater canyons. Every level of the ecosystem was doing well. Tiny little nudibranchs, these snails without shells that crawl over encrusting sponges I saw, and animals like a leather jacket, a type of trigger fish that plays a vital role as well. This animal grazes on the bottom and creates bare spots so that new life can take hold. That's what I saw, that everything needs to be protected as a whole. You know, I wanted to end with, well, not end, but get close to ending with one of these pictures that I call my primal ocean Photo photograph. And this picture was made on a very stormy day in New Zealand when the boat captain didn't actually want to go out. But I had this image in mind and I sort of convinced him to take me out because the day before I had tea with an old time Kiwi diver, an old time New Zealand diver named Wade Doak, who was diving in this particular place, the Poor Knights Island, back in the 1950s and 60s and was still diving today. And over tea, he told me that he believed that the marine life and the overall ecosystem was healthier today than it was in the 1950s or 1960s when he started diving there. And as I left him that day and was preparing my equipment for the next day's dive, it sort of dawned on me that I couldn't think of any place else I'd ever been in the world where somebody has said that. You know, everywhere I go, people say, you should have been here 10 years ago. The corals were better. There were more sharks. There were more fish, you know, 20 years ago. But here was a place that was better today than it was in the 1950s simply because they protected it in the 1980s. So the message is clear, you know, that Nature is resilient and tolerant to a point, but we must see and we must act. So in closing, we step away and once again see our planet from a distance, knowing that all these things are happening down there in the blue parts and so much more. In the final paragraph of my book, Ocean Soul, I say the following. We are all connected to the sea and tied to her fate. The wounds suffered by Earth's oceans are not fatal, we can still turn the tide of past harm into a groundswell of future protection. Scientists have described what is happening to the heart of the sea. Images reveal her soul. With both as our guides, we can serve as vigilant guardians of the sea and she will again thrive. I remain hopeful that her siren song will echo loud and clear and continue to seduce men and women of future generations to leave the safety of the water's edge and explore. Thanks very much. Um, I don't know what the plan is. I'm happy to entertain questions if there are questions.
Uh, we are going to uh, uh, we're going to take a little time for some questions. We want to leave enough time though for Brian to uh, 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 be up in the uh, lobby and and actually uh, sign some of his books. So if you want to get his book, it's it is available upstairs, right? And um, so we'll probably take time for uh, three or four questions if people would like to pose a question to this incredible guy who just put together some, those were some pretty good snapshots, weren't they? Thank you. Okay, why don't I let you take charge of that? I believe there's a underwater national park off Hawaii. Have you dived there? Um, so the question was, have I dived in an underwater national park off Hawaii? I, I'm only aware of the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, which has been protected as a, a marine reserve, and I have not yet dived there, but I'm, I'm starting a new story um, about tiger sharks, and I, I hope to be up there in a place called French Frigate Shoals uh, within the next year or so. But I've talked to people who've been up there, and it's, it's quite spectacular. Yeah. Who in the room knows what the Hawaiian name is for this place? Hmm. Come on, we've got to have somebody just shout it out. Beautiful. All right. All right. Way to go. <laughs> the rest of us just call it Papa. Papa. I was just curious, with the 300,000 visitors at Goat Island, is that impacting the area at all? That's a great question about the impact of 300,000. <laughs> to my knowledge, no. Um, it's all very sort of benign in the sense that they're not seem to be doing any damage. They actually have set up little stands where people can rent masks and fins and snorkels, um, and, a, and a number of people do that. But in the time that I spent there, I um, I saw much more people on land just standing on the rocks looking over the side because you can see fish right there, you know, just sort of swirling about and schooling around. So I don't know what percentage actually go in, but there were a lot of kids in the water, but yeah, they everything seemed to be pretty good. The fish were pretty friendly, you know, they weren't like scared of people. Yeah. Um, I read an article recently that said half of the tuna that we order in restaurants isn't even tuna. So I was wondering with the lack of information about our source of seafood, what the average consumer can do to limit the negative impact they're having. And I was also wondering whether you eat seafood. Oh yeah, great question. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I, I actually love seafood, but I, I don't eat very much because of environmental reasons. Um, I don't eat tuna. I, I love it, but I don't. You know, if I was on a boat somewhere in the Pacific and somebody hand-lined a yellowfin or something and cooked it up, for, yeah, I, I wouldn't be opposed to that, but um, I, I try not to support, you know, that sort of industrialization level because I think it's just out of, out of whack. Um, I remember meeting, when I worked in that Global Fish Story years ago, I met with the director of the Intertropical Pacific Tuna Organization or whatever, which was a 14-nation organization. And they, it didn't really have any teeth. They, they couldn't enforce things, but they couldn't set guidelines. And I met with the director at that time, who was an Australian guy, and I never expected him to say this, but he actually came clean and told me that he had recommended that they cut their quotas at that time by 50%. This was back in like 2005. So he was he was proposing that they cut them 50%, which was you know probably means they should have cut them 100%, right? But but that and even then they rejected that. So so I don't want to encourage that. So I do eat some things, you know, certain shellfish are good, um, some wild caught things like salmon, Alaskan salmon, if I'm in the Northwest or whatever, no no problem. And I also think um, that there is a lot of progress being made with aquaculture. I I was always sort of you know had a bad feeling about aquaculture, but I've got a new story coming out, it'll be in the June issue of Natural, uh, National Geographic about aquaculture, and we focus mostly on th the, the good news and as a solution, you know, methods that are effective. And I learned a lot, and I, I do think it's, it's, it's a good thing. But that leads me to your other part of the question, which is um, truth in, in what you're buying and, and labeling, and, and I think that's the real problem, is that in this country and, and pretty much everywhere, you don't have truthful labeling as far as I know is, is, is best that I can tell and you don't know what you're getting. So for example, I, I photographed this company in Panama that, that raises cobia, which is a sushi grade whitefish, really good fish. And it's a New York guy. He started the company at, when he was 25 years old. He's in Panama. He's got them growing in these big open ocean pens, a lot of current flow. So the waste gets distributed. It's not, you know, polluted to the environment. The feed conversion ratio, what he feeds them, is is very good. He's trying to augment protein, uh, soy protein for you know 
carnivorous fish protein, things like that. So he's trying to do the right thing. And there's other companies that are raising cobia, same fish, in Southeast Asia. They're, they're mowing down mangroves. They're growing them in, you know, these little pools and chemicals and everything. And, and theirs will be cheaper than his just by virtue. And yet, I don't know that when you see it in a, in a grocery store, if you see it in a grocery store, you can tell. So with the tuna issue, I, maybe. I mean, I know that for years, things like scallops were skate wing. And, you know, there was always lots of games being played. So I really think that this is an area that needs a lot of work. Um, certainly by, by legislators in this government in the U.S. to, to sort of crack down because I, I think you can educate yourself, you can get seafood watch cards, you can come to the aquarium here and learn about things and read, but unless you can see accurately what you're buying, then it's going to be difficult. So do the best you can. I mean, I, I, that's all we all can do, but it is, it is difficult. Let me offer a little hope on that. Um, mm -hmm. Right here in Maryland, we have actually got a, a bill going through the state house right now. It's been passed by the house. It's being taken up by the Senate. And it is a truth in seafood labeling law. Uh, if we can do it, I think we'll be the first state actually to do it. Hawaii's yeah, got it great. in some counties, and the whole idea is that you it would require that the uh, that the source of the of the the fish itself is identified, the country of origin. Um, what else, Laura? The the species, the actual, they have to say it. And if the, and there's a there's a, an enforcement regimen so that you get in trouble if you do mislabel because Perfect. this whole no. notion of seafood fraud is is huge. So. Well, that would that would be the solution, and then you know, hopefully, it'll start other states doing the same. Absolutely, we, we need it. Yeah. We do, we do. Time for uh, two more questions, I think. So why don't we get one back over there, and then we'll pick one over here, or maybe in the middle. What do you shoot with primarily? Um, if camera wise, I'm an I'm a I don't yeah, it's all I shoot with. Um, I'm a Nikon shooter, so I I use Nikon D4 cameras. Um, they just came out with the D4S, which means, you know, got to spend more money. Um, <laughs> and um, my underwater housings are uh, from an Austrian-made company called Subal. Uh, so Subal and, and those. And then, you know, I, I take down lights, uh, uh, strobes and so forth to, to bring back some color. So, yeah. Are you a photographer? Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, you know, there are, most cameras are really good these days. Um, uh, but I, I've just been a Nikon shooter for many years, and I, I really like what they do. Uh, you talked a lot about your encounters with various sharks. You had tiger sharks and whale sharks. My question was, have you ever had or are you planning to have encounters with great whites? Um, yes, yeah, so the question was about have I encountered great whites. Yeah, I have. Um, I've, I've dived with great whites in Australia, Mexico, Guadalupe. I actually opened that place up uh, with my friend Howard Hall years ago. Nobody was going there. We started doing some trips on our own, and then it caught on. And then um, I've been in California off Ana Nuevo with them as well. But um, interestingly, yes, I am beginning four new stories for National Geographic about sharks. Um, it's rather unprecedented. And um, the plan right now is to publish them all in 2016 consecutively, four months in a row. So um, it'll be like four of the top five predatory sharks. And, and the last one in August of 2016 will be about great whites. And, you know, there's some really interesting science. What I want these stories to do is sort of peel back the veil on these animals. I want to celebrate them as very complex creatures that are essential. You know, we need predators, and we can't kill 100 million of them. But by showing some of the new science, some of the new data on, on their migrations and their specialization, how long they live, where they you know, go and all these things. But we still don't know very much, but the little bits that we're learning is proving fascinating. So I think that combined with it's being an interesting time for photographic technology means we should be able to do a good story. So we'll see. <laughs> Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, join me again in thanking Brian for an incredible talk. Uh, before we turn you loose, a uh, couple housekeeping notes. Uh, but before we get to that, actually, I, I do want to let you know that uh, first of all, we we are we have two more um, talks this spring uh, in our series. I've been told spring is going to come, <laughs> although apparently not next week. Uh, and so on April 22nd, uh, just a little over a month from now, will be the Power of Film Inspiring Action for Monterey Bay with renowned marine photographer and filmmaker Bob Talbot, who's a friend of Brian's and mine, and who did that fabulous video that's out in the uh, lobby out there. And so Bob will be here on April 22nd. And then on May 7th, 
really interesting talk by a guy named Ed Lyman. It's on a humpback whale rescue in the Hawaiian Islands. Ed Lyman has led or participated in 70 rescues of large whales. Unfortunately, these are animals entangled in fishing gear and other marine debris. Hawaiian Islands, Alaska, U.S. West Coast. It's going to be a fascinating talk on uh, May 7th. So those are the two that are coming up. You know, uh, we're all about, I think, I'm, I'm, I'm t preaching to my choir right now, but at the National Aquarium, our mission is to inspire conservation of the world's aquatic treasures. Treasures can be places, they can be animals, they can be complete ecosystems, they can be communities of plants, animals, and humans as well. Uh, I think what we've just seen tonight with Brian is a, an incredible collection of aquatic treasures. And the important thing is that any treasure is worth protecting and preserving. So let's, let's all join you know, together to make sure that we can do our part and demand the right kind of legislation, uh, look for those kinds of, 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 of honest and, and, and legitimate kinds of treatments of things like seafood, um, because I think it's, it all starts with us. It really does. And with that, I want to thank you for coming. Brian will be up in the lobby uh, for probably about a half an hour. And uh, if, you, if you want to get your book signed by him, please do. And again, I hope we'll see you here on, uh, on April 22nd. Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs>